And so the one major issue is sin. Let us say this together. Our one major issue is sin. Okay. And when we understand this, understand that sin is missing the mark of God's standard. Sin is disobeying God's ways. But sin is not just behavior. Sin is belief. And when you try to treat the behavior without changing the belief, what happens is the belief just keeps on changing outfits and you keep on getting in a cycle and you still can't fix anything. So we're going to go to an iconic scripture this morning. Uh, we're going to read it in the message version because it speaks so clearly, so well, and conversationally that I believe is going to relate well with us, uh, help us look at a familiar passage in a greater way. Let's go to Romans chapter 7, verses 14 through 25. Romans chapter 7, verses 14 through 25. We're going to, um, we know participation is better than what? Amen. Amen. Let us stand to our feet as we read the word of God. Romans chapter 7, starting at verse 14, going through verse 25. Let's join in. I can anticipate the response that is coming. I know that all God's commands are spiritual, but I'm not. Isn't this also your experience? Yes. I'm full of myself. After all, I've spent a long time in sin's prison. What I don't understand about myself is that I decide one way, but then I act another, doing things I absolutely despise. So if I can't be trusted to figure out what is best for myself and then do it, it becomes obvious that God's command is necessary. But I need something more. For if I know the law but still can't keep it, and if the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best intentions, I obviously need help. I realize that I don't have what it takes. I can will it, but I can't do it. I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. I decide not to do bad, but then I do it anyway. My decisions, such as they are, don't result in actions. Something has gone wrong deep within me and gets the better of me every time. It happens so regularly that it's predictable. The moment I decide to do good, sin is there to trip me up. I truly delight in God's commands, but it's pretty obvious that not all of me joins in that delight. Parts of me covertly rebel and just when I least expect it, they take charge. I've tried everything and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? Isn't that the real question? The answer, thank God, is that Jesus Christ can and does. He acted to set things right in this life of contradictions where I want to serve God with all my heart and mind, but I'm pulled by the influence of sin to do something totally different. Let's go back just one verse, verse 24. I've tried everything and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? Isn't that the real question? I'm going to pull back to Y2K for this title. Uh, look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, Oops, I did it again. <laughs> Come on, do your best Britney Spears impersonation. Look at the other neighbor and say, oops, I did it again. Amen, you may be seated. Oops, I did it again. It is my hope today that we understand this simple thing. You have one major issue, and you have one solution. 
one major issue and one solution. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. And as we come to this moment, I pray, Lord, that your word that is already blessed, that it will be made clear to us. Lord, that even as I preach, God, give me the clarity of mind and speech that will help your people hear you, understand you in a greater way. May the words of my mouth and meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. And God, I pray that our hearts are open, our minds are open, and that you will bring revelation to information that would equal and end in transformation. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Oops, I did it again. I know some of y'all were born after this crave of Britney Spears in the year 2000. Something about pop music. Even if you don't like it, it's catchy. I wasn't a Britney Spears fan. How dare I be a brawly black African-American football player <laughs> and be? It's like it didn't work because I can't, I can't walk around just singing that. But you know what? Everybody was bopping to it. They caught everybody, this whole locker room. Oops. I did it again. And the thing is, this song is catchy, but it's toxic. She playing with people's emotions in and out of the relationship and falling in love and all these things. And just because it's catchy doesn't mean that it's healthy. And we got to be careful that we don't allow trends to transform us from truth. And even as we think about the concept of the song, if you never heard it, have you a pop Sunday and don't do it. Listen to the song, but don't let the entertainment become your education. But as I think about the repeated cycle that she describes and she sings about, knowing I need to stop what I'm doing. But then she said, oops, I did it again. And I know we're not even that deep into the sermon. But how many of us already know you can relate at least to the sentiment of something you tried to stop, a thing you tried to get away from, a behavior, a habit, or something that you say, I'm not going to do it again, just to find yourself now sounding like Britney Spears. Oops, I did it again. <laughs> now, my wife really laughed at me as I was giving this concept to her. As I hit the high-pitched falsetto <laughs> and sang the song to her. There are some privileges to marriage that y'all would never experience. Y'all would never hear me hit the falsetto note that I did for my wife as I was telling her what I was going to preach. But let me just tell y'all, I could have got a record deal. <laughs> if I was a liar, this would be my time to admit, oops, I did it again. Y'all should have kept up with me right there. Um, and so, as I think about this concept of this cycle and the things that we get into, Romans chapter 7, I believe, just paints the picture of the tension, the, the duality, and may I even say the hostile dichotomy that we live with in this human experience. It's hostile. We have a war inside of us that's going on, flesh and spirit, good and evil. And this war is going on all the time, non-stop. If you don't believe me, have you ever had a good day living right, thinking right, reading right, praying right, just to have a dream to remind you you're not right? Yeah. Mess me up. I woke up one time, I said, now, Lord, you know I'm, you know I'm better than that. But what I was involved in in that dream was diabolical. And I, I, and I came a long way. Do I got something I don't know about? Keep me from my own oops. And so when I think about Romans 7, Paul wrestles not just with a theological concept. Because when you read the book of Romans, it's dense. It's a very dense book. And it has a lot of legal knees, like a lot of legal language in it. And he's constantly wrestling with this idea of law, which is the command of God and liberty that's in God. And he's constantly showing us that we needed the law to help us understand what sin was. But we need Jesus to set us free because the law can't do it. But what the law does... 
it lets you know how much of a sinner you are. This is why also in Romans, he go ahead and he go ahead and put it out there. You know, people can come to church and try to look cute and act like the, and act like the sermon does not relate to them. But Paul says, I'm gonna give you an all-inclusive invitation. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory. Every single one of us, every single one of us, from the potentate to the poor, everybody has sinned from the dignitary to the dejected. Everybody has sinned. Everybody has fallen short of the glory. And then he even says this, and the wages of sin is what? Death. This means when people be like, God, I deserve more. Mm -mm. Better check yourself before you wreck yourself. God, I deserve more. You deserve more? No, you better be glad you're breathing. Every time you say, I deserve this, say, nope, no, no, I'm good. I'm good right there. I'm good right here. My little stress, my little joy, my little anxiety. You know what? God, I don't deserve more. What I am, I'm asking for more, though. I don't deserve it. Paul wanted us to know that you can't save yourself, but you need saving. And so in Romans 7, it's not just a theological wrestle now. It's an experiential testimony and journey. Could you imagine the Apostle Paul having this radical conversion that's recorded in Acts chapter 9, going from Saul, a sinner and killer, a persecutor of the church, going to the saint now, the Apostle Paul writing letters, planting churches, doing missionary journeys, healing the sick, and, and, and he has to admit that in all of this, I still have a struggle. You know, when you are broken, bottomed out, you don't hold back details to your own dark side. Let me say it again. Because when you, when you know you're at the bottom, and, so, and you know other people know you're at the bottom, when you start talking to them, you go ahead and let them know, look, I am messed up. I don't even get it twisted. I can't get it right Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and twice on Sundays. I just can't get it. But when you feel like you clean and you feel like you've been doing pretty good, you don't want, you don't want to tear down the idol of your image. So what Paul does in Romans 7, he says, listen, I have an issue, and I believe you do too. And even as you read it in the message version, didn't it bless y'all as we were reading it? He said, he said, he says, I, I know that all God's commands are spiritual, but I'm not. Isn't this also your experience? Yes, I'm full of myself. After all, I've spent a long time in sin's prison. What I don't understand about myself is that I decide one way, but then I act another, doing things I absolutely despise. <laughs> then I like this, it says, so if I can't be trusted, if I can't be trusted to figure out what is best for myself and then do it, it becomes obvious I need God's commands. If I can't be trusted to figure out what's good for me. And he's like, I make the decision to do the good thing. But then somewhere between decision and behavior, something gets broken. And I love how he says this moment right here at the end of 17 through 20. He says something has gone wrong deep within me. Everybody say deep. Something has gone wrong deep within me. Something has gone wrong deep within me. And, and, what the, how does he finish it off? And it what? Gets the better of me when? Every time. Fam, I want us to be real. We got a real deep issue. And when you try to normalize what is unhealthy and sinful, you will stop reaching for the solution. When you try to characterize the issue as something else, then you don't apply the ointment to the right thing. We have one major issue. Here's our one major issue. Our one major issue is sin. It's sin. I know people don't use that language often. I know it's, you know, here he is with a fire and brimstone message. Well, I'm going to give you fire and brimstone and fire extinguisher today. But until you know you're on fire, you're not going to reach for the extinguisher. And the church said what? Amen. Amen. People run around and I just a little hot. No, homie. <laughs> you on fire, Cletus? <laughs> <laughs> 
And so the one major issue is sin. Let us say this together. Our one major issue is sin. Okay. And when we understand this, understand that sin is missing the mark of God's standard. Sin is disobeying God's ways. But sin is not just behavior. Sin is belief. And when you try to treat the behavior without changing the belief, what happens is the belief just keeps on changing outfits and you keep on getting in a cycle and you still can't fix anything. So our one major issue is sin. Here's the thing. People love to talk about all the other issues. Talk about world poverty. That's an issue. Very serious issue. Talk about inequities in society. Major issue. Talk about climate change. Major issue. Talk about economic downturn. Uh, it could be an issue. Talk about political polarization. Issue. Uh, talk about racial disparities and, and racism and violence towards different people. An issue. Talk about sexual morality. That's an issue. Huh. But here's what I'm saying. All of them, put them in a basket and put the label on it. Y'all better preach to me. And when we make those issues isolated from sin, we'll never apply the right solution. So sin, when we look at it, it's, I want us to understand the poison, the pattern, and the prison of it. The poison of sin. Even in the Psalms, David said, I was born into sin and shaped into iniquity. When he says that, it messes you up a little bit because, like, aren't I created in the image of God? Yeah. But creation kind of messed up the birthing process. That once you breathe in the oxygen of this atmosphere, the curse of Adam and Eve travels thousands of years. It gets into your bloodstream. Changes the way you think. You don't have to teach a child shame or to lie. They innately have evil developing within them. And what happens is when you don't disciple that early, that evil dog going to be bigger than the moral dog. We are born into sin. Adam and Eve, they disobeyed God's command in the garden. And then they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Here's the thing. They had eternal life. They weren't supposed to experience sickness or pain. But once they got the knowledge of good and evil, he knew that humanity could not have that knowledge without exploring evil. And if they explore evil without having a death day, that they were going to torture themselves for all of eternity. And so when he put death and instituted death as a result, of sin, it was actually an act of mercy that we would not torture ourselves for eternity. And so when people don't understand why do people die, it is an act of mercy that I don't want you to torture yourself with the evil that you have introduced yourself to. And the only way that I can give you eternal life in the way I plan it is that I rid you of sin. And the only way I can rid you of sin is cover you in the blood and then take you out of this flesh so you can live in eternity with me. And so in this moment, sin, the poison of sin is all around us and in our bloodstream, in our mind. And specifically, it shows up in these ways right here. Here you go. Your life goes in the direction of your attitudes, your appetites, and your affections. I've said it before. I'm going to say it again. Your life goes in the direction of your attitudes, your attractions, and your appetites. Your attitudes is how you think, what you believe. Your attractions is what gets your attention and what you like. Your, your appetites is what satisfies your desires. Now, when sin gets in, sin manipulates all of those things to draw you further from God and into the grips of sin. In other words, the perversion that comes in, your attitude now becomes pride. And when the way 1 John says it, we have three things. Sin, this world offers three, three things. 
Pride of, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. In my words, I just say attitudes, appetites, and affections. That your, your, your now your flesh begins to desire things that you should not partake in. Now, when something tastes good, you will, uh, you will run the risk of pain for the sake of pleasure. Anybody in here got a gluten sensitivity at all? I didn't know what gluten was. I think gluten didn't come till, till the internet. I think it was like, you got internet in your house, and you get gluten in your gut. You know, all the stuff I ate, <laughs> I was like, man, I ain't never had, oh, stomach hurt. To eat chi- y'all think about to eat chitlins and be okay? Y'all know what chitlins is? Or oh, chitterlings? If you call them chitterlings, the chitlins, to eat chitlins and be okay, I should be able to handle some gluten. Uh, anyway, I digress. <laughs> but you think about gluten, and it can be, you know, gluten, it's like when Jesus said he the bread of life, I know why he said it, because we, we like bread. Every time they put a little bread on the table, you be like, I'm just going to get a little piece, I'm trying to wash my carbs. Let be a little gluten in there, but that butter hit right. Yeah. You like, you know what? I'm gonna eat some bananas and, and blueberries so the antioxidants and the potassium tomorrow. But right now, I'm gonna go ahead and eat this. I'm gonna be curled over tomorrow, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and get this. When something tastes good, you'll run the risk of pain. You go in the direction of your appetites, the things that you desire. When something is attractive, uh, you begin to move in that direction. You can like exactly what you got till you see what other people got. Mm-hmm. You like, man, I really like, I really like my my hoopty. Y'all know what a hoopty is? Okay, a hoopty. I, I like my hoopty. It's a little broke down car, but it get you from point A to point B. You still put a little tire shine on it from time to time. And you like when it start up because it talks to you when it start up. You start up, like, how you doing? <laughs> you pack the accelerator. I'm doing good. <laughs> You're cool. You're cool with your hoop there. Until you see somebody with their Humvee. And you're like, oh, theirs got four wheel drive. Mine got one wheel drive. Gosh, I need to upgrade attractions. The thing happened like that too. You, you like your wife. You like your husband. You like your kids till you see somebody else's family. Till you see somebody else's wife. Till you see somebody else's husband. Then you be looking at your husband laying over there just looking sloppy. And he looked at him like, man, if you just go, just do one crunch. I'm signing you up for the wellness challenge, baby. You dehydrated. You ain't sleeping well. Yeah. So anyway, and you, you were fine until you saw such and such husband. Such and such husband over here doing CrossFit. They 75 years old doing pull-ups. And he's like, I got to put pull-ups on you. You used to like putting pull-ups on them. Like, you're so cute. Now you don't like it because you saw somebody. All right, I'm joking. Let me, I got to tighten up, y'all. <laughs> your life goes in those directions. And so what the poison of sin does, sin poisons your ability to like what God has for you. It messes up your appetite. It messes up your attractions. And as Paul says, something deep has gone wrong within us, and it gets the better of us. The desire to do good is within me, but there is no ability. So then that leads us to the next thing. That's the poison. But then the pattern, the pattern of sin. He says it like this in in Romans 7. He said, it happens regularly that it's predictable. (laughs) Y'all, have you ever saw yourself going in the wrong direction? And you couldn't stop the train because I already left the station. And then you start saying some jacked up theology like this. He going to forgive me anyway. I know I ain't the only one that had prayed that before. And sometimes it's like, you, like, I know I'm not supposed to do it. But there's something deep within me that overpowers my will. Now I'm caught in this pattern. Here's the thing about patterns. The patterns we follow today determine the path we walk tomorrow. The patterns we follow today determine the path we walk tomorrow. And if I want to understand what your future is, I can look at your patterns today and tell you where you're going to end up. 
People are like, ooh, Satan peeked into your future. Satan don't have that ability, but he can look at your patterns and say, yep, you're going to end up right there. He already know who you're going to call when you're struggling, when you're lonely. He know you're not going to call the Ghostbusters. But he know, because you've been talking to that person, you've been meditating on that person, you've been looking at their pictures, you've been, you've been thinking about, ooh, what Netflix movie Right? So again, you got to think, your patterns, but all of us have patterns, and when negative patterns, when a negative pattern is started, it multiplies negative results. And when a good pattern is started, it multiplies positive results. But it's a whole lot harder to stop negative energy than it is to get positive energy started. Like, it is difficult to stop a negative pattern. Sin has a pattern, and I love the way Eugene Peterson put it in the message version. It's predictable. I remember, uh, I remember early on in my faith journey, and this is really in the sanctification phase. I was just saved. And so, you know, when I first got saved, I didn't know what sin was. And so it was things I was regularly doing that was sinful. And as I came to know Christ, it was like my eyes just opened. And then I was like, oh, that's actually sin. Oh. I thought I was going to hell before, but good Lord. <laughs> Man, I didn't realize I had a first-class ticket. <laughs> and I started noticing my patterns. And so I was like, Lord, I can't, I, uh, uh, I can't stop it. I don't know what's going to happen. Some of you all, you don't even realize it, and hopefully you have a revelation. You are tempted the same day, the same time with the same thing. You're going to get to 9.56 p.m. And you're going to recognize you do something the same day, around the same hour, and you get caught up in the same thing. Yo, I had to put a bad time on myself to stop the pattern. Because I knew if I saw 11 o'clock, what they say? What come out at night? Oh, see, y'all nasty. Y'all nasty. The fact that y'all knew that, y'all nasty. And I was too. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Glory. <laughs> but I knew. I said, if I'm not asleep, I'm sinning. I, I knew. I was like, listen, I can go to church and everything, but if I'm not asleep, I'm sinning. Now lay me down to sleep. Pray the Lord, my soul, the king. I had to stop the pattern. <laughs> and so when it gets to this moment, sin has a pattern. You'll get tempted with some of the same things at the same time. It's a pattern. It's predictable. Study yourself to know when you're weak. Listen, I'm going to dig deep in this throughout the series. But look, it's certain smells you can't even be around. Come on. It's certain. Listen, if you, I ain't trying to make nobody sin. So it's certain things, though, you get around and your brain triggers. You're like, mm, mm. It's like somebody hit the cold like you the winter soldier. They done said something to you. Then all of a sudden, you know exactly the next step. And here it is. You done hit a home run in sin. Because you've been practicing swings. You didn't even know you still had muscle memory. So what happens when the poison and the pattern keep on working? You get caught up in the prison of sin. The prison of sin. I love Romans 7, 14. He said, I spent so long in sin's prison. He recognized, hey, I am a convicted sinner. You know, people like, you know, that they have a felony on their record, like it never leaves. And so they then begin to identify as it, and their record begins to push their thought pattern, right? And so now, in this moment, it's like, look, I've been in prison for a long time. I got some prison ways about me. And so Romans 7, 23 to 24, it said, parts of me covertly rebel. And, and, and just when I least expect it, they take charge. Don't you hate when the worst part of you show up in the wrong moment? Like, I, I really thought I was going to be better this time around. But then the other part of you just jumped up and said, no, not yet. <laughs> I'm still here. <laughs> like, we all, like, you ever watched the Gremlins movie? What was the little cute one name? Gizmo. Right? That's how we pitch ourselves. Add a little bit of water. <laughs> that's what I'm telling you. And then you hear that's what sin does. You was good. Add a little bit of water. Look, I see people asking questions now. Like, what is, what is the gremlins? <laughs> it's, it's, go watch it. It's fun. I think kind of, it's, it's demonic. 
Uh, so, back to my sermon. <laughs> so, Romans, so then we're in Romans 7. What y'all talking about? Romans 7, he said it gets so predictable. And he said, part, he said, parts of me covertly rebel. So it's like you got parts of you that are like, yes, we're going well. And then you got other parts like, no, we're not. No, we're not. Mm-mm, not today. And you get pulled in the wrong direction. And what he's talking about is sin's influence. Sin still has influence. He said, I've done everything that I can do and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there anyone? Is there no one that can do anything for me? And that cry of desperation is the very cry that we must live with. We must recognize I can't do anything for myself. I cannot help myself. I don't have enough willpower. I don't have enough discipline. I need help. We need, to, we need to actually get the, get the help wanted sign out of our closet and put it on our soul and say, Lord, I need help. And so now in this moment, he recognizes I need something. Now, when we talk about what's the one major issue? What's the one major issue? That's the one major issue. Now, there are many different tentacles or either manifestations or either displays of sin. You have one major issue. And in Christian tradition, they have been known as the seven deadly sins. They don't, it's not all inclusive, but these are considered what they call capital vices. Capital vices are sins that typically cause other sin nature to, to awaken and to multiply. Capital vices is like these are the ones that typically give birth to other sins. So sin essentially hypnotizes us, distorts our ability to have a healthy morale. And that's the poison. That's the pattern. That's the prison. And when you get into that prison of sin, then you begin to see the different shackles of sin. The traditional seven deadly sins sound something like this. We have pride. We have envy, wrath, sloth, greed, gluttony, and lust. When we look at pride, pride is an excessive belief in one's own abilities or importance, leading to arrogance and a lack of humility. Pride, an excessive belief in one's own ability, in one's own abilities and or importance, leading to arrogance and a lack of humility. Some of us, that's your capital vice. And if you say, no, that's not me. If it's not you, it's not you. You ain't going to say it. But if it is you, and you're like, nah, that, nah that's not me. That's a, that is a symptom. <laughs> Envy, a feeling of discontentment and resentment aroused by someone else's possessions, qualities, or achievements. If you came here, you looked at somebody else like, man, I wish. There you go. There you go. As soon as you want what somebody else got, and you mad that they got it, there you go. Envy, a feeling of discontentment and resentment aroused by someone else's possessions, achievements, and qualities. Wrath, intense anger and hatred that can lead to violence, revenge, or harmful behavior. Wrath, if you know you're one of those people that you just see red or either you black out and you don't care what happens while you black out, boom. If your immediate response to an issue is like this, that is a symptom. Bless the Lord. (laughs) And so when we look at these ideas, when we look at these ideas like wrath, it means that you are now controlled by anger. Here's the thing. Anger itself is not a sin. Be angry and sin not. The issue is when you're dealing with wrath, it's like anger running the whole, the whole board in inside out. Sloth, apathy, and laziness characterized by refusal to work or to take responsibility often resulting in wasted potential. Yep. A lot of people dealing with that. They be like, man, nobody wants to help me. You, you, you lazy. <laughs> when when are we going to be okay with just calling that out? You lazy. That's what it is. Okay, all right. Sloth. Well, here's the thing. That begins to control your life. And look, procrastination is an indication of slothfulness. It's not just that you move slow. It's that you think slow. <laughs> Five. Greed. An insatiable desire for material wealth or gain often leading to selfishness and a a disregard for others. 
If you got enough and you still want more, you're greedy. If you got something that you like and then somebody else gets something, you want to get something better than them, greed. If you're mad just because somebody got something and you're like, man, I should have more, greed. If you go up, back to the, no, that's the next one, gluttony. If you <laughs> excessive indulgence in food, drink, or other pleasures leading to overconsumption and lack of self-discipline. Yeah, gluttony is the most normalized sin in our nation, in the world, gluttony. And here's the thing. People think it's all about food. Mm -mm. It says, or any other pleasures. So some of us, you in the pattern because you're gluttonous. And it ain't even about food. It could be about something else. You're just gluttonous. So you're like, I want more. It's insatiable. It never stops. Um, then number seven, lust. An intense or uncontrolled desire, often of a sexual nature, that objectifies others and distorts healthy relationships. Intense or uncontrolled desires, often of a sexual nature, that objectifies other, others and distorts healthy relationships. If you notice that a lot of these capital vices is where our industries have made their most money. And here's the thing. We've been in the prison so long, we keep on feeding the system. It's a supply only because there's a demand. And you could talk about, we need to stop pornography. Well, we got a lust and a gluttony greed issue. So we dehumanize people to feed a pleasure and then put a dollar sign on them and a moment on them. And then we say, we need to change the industry. No, we're trying to change the industry. We need to, our souls needs to be changed. Because when we put effort in changing the industry, the industry, the industry will shut down and your simple self will come up with another one. And then you end up being the capital one. You end up being the one to get all the gain. Paul said, what can I do? What do we do about this? Isn't that the real question? Who can help us? Who can help us? These list of vices... Or seven, de or seven deadly sins, these vices you'll see all throughout the Bible. You'll see it in Galatians 5 when he says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentious, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, rivalries, and the like. He's saying these are all the works of the flesh. And here's the thing, family, all those seven, we're going to spend the next seven weeks going through all of them, each one individually. So we can go ahead and deal with our deep issues because we got one major issue sin but it shows up in a lot of ways and so when people come to church you just want to feel good I think the pathway to feeling good is being healed in your soul and so we ask the question what's the real question who can help us is there anybody that can help? I love Romans 7, 25, and I love how it says it right here. It says, thank God. The answer, thank God, is that Jesus Christ, watch this, can and does. I, I love it. He has the ability and the availability. Thank God in Jesus Christ. He gives us victory over our own vices. Thank God in Jesus Christ that no matter how big the sin is, no matter how nasty it is, no matter how long you've been in it, no matter how long it's been in your family line, no matter how many ways it shows up, no matter how many times it shows up, I know the solution. Thank God in Jesus Christ. He can and he does. It was in the past, it's in the present, and he'll be our help in the future. Is there anybody in here that can thank God that in the midst of your shame, in the midst of your sin, in the midst of your debauchery, in the midst of your idolatry, in the midst of your lying, in the midst of your jealousy, in the midst of your envy, in the midst of your immorality, in the midst of your envy, you got a savior that jumped right into your oops moment. And every time you say oops, I did it again. He says my mercies are new this morning. My grace is sufficient. And whom the Son sets free, he is free indeed. Is there anybody in here that can celebrate? I'm not by myself. I got a Savior. He walks with me. He talks with me. He knows all about my troubles. We got 
God our Savior who meets us in the midst of our vice. Ha! Thanks be unto God that gives us victory. Because we got one issue, sin. And we got one solution, Jesus. Come on. Come on. Let's celebrate it. Let's celebrate it. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you why I celebrate him. Because he'll reach way down and he'll pick you up. The old saints used to tell me, he'll reach way down and pick you up. Y'all ain't get it yet. When you down in your sin, when you under the muck and the mire, he has a way to reach down from heaven with mercy and grace. He'll pick you up. Turn you around and place your feet hey, on solid ground. Can I get a witness today, family? We got a Savior who is able. He'll reach you right where you are. He'll reach you right where you are. And you happen to show up today and you thought that you're going to leave here by yourself defeated. But I can't let you know, his power don't stop in the sanctuary. His power don't stop 2,000 years ago. Because when they hung him high and they stretched him wide, and when he hung his hand and then he died, that was the only death we needed. We don't need the blood of bulls and goats. Because the blood, it still works. It reaches to the lowest valley. It stretches across all of creation and it washes us, it cleanses us. There is power, there is power, wonder working power in the blood. He reaches you, he rescues you, he redeems you. And if it just stopped there, that would be a lot to celebrate. But aren't you glad that when they put him in that grave, he didn't stay there. But you gotta understand when they went to that grave, he didn't go just by himself. He took everything that was coming against us, everything we already did, and everything we will do, and he put the burden on his back, and he put him in the grave. And three days later, he rose with all power in his hands. Death, sin, and the grave was defeated so that now, this week, you can have victory. And as the old school saints say, victory is mine. I told Satan, get thee behind. Victory today is mine. Family, I gotta go home. But I just want you to know that we got a Savior worth praising because he gets us out of our poison. He breaks our patterns and he'll free us over and over again. Let's give God a great praise in here today, family. I believe freedom. Wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Hallelujah. So in this moment, family, we just create an atmosphere of vulnerability and victory. Vulnerable where we're weak and victorious where we believe. So if there's things that you're saying, look, I'm caught up in it. In Romans 7, I could have wrote it better. Don't leave here hiding it. Don't leave here continuously defeated. Grab faith. Grab the truth. He can set you free. Father, in this moment, I pray now, Lord, that you will speak to us. And God, while we're vulnerable, remind us we're not by ourselves. You are our shepherd. And you're walking with us. Your goodness and mercy follows us. All right, family, in the midst of this moment, here's, here's, hear this. I named seven. I named seven deadly sins, capital vices. And we're going to do a corporate confession. 
If you're dealing with pride, envy, wrath, sloth, greed, gluttony, or lust, if you know that that's in your life, you know exactly which ones, maybe you like, I kind of got an idea. If you know that's you, I'm not going to ask you to come up to the front right now, but I'm going to ask you just to open up your heart, posture your heart, and ask the Lord to help you in that area. Ask the Lord to help you in that area. Now repeat after me. And when I, when I get to the blank, that's when you're just going to say whatever it is that you're asking God to show up in. Lord, I need your help. I am a sinner that only can be saved by your grace. I believe that I cannot save myself. I believe that you died for my sins and you rose from the grave. I confess you as my Lord and Savior. Now, Lord, I need help in this specific area. Now, go ahead and name it, whatever it may be. Let's close this prayer. Lord, I believe you are able to help me, to heal me, and make me whole. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise.